All right. Hi there, folks. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Stephanie, and I will be one of your co-hosts for today's webinar. Uh, this webinar is one of several webinars that are a part of our larger BrainHQ Academy series. Now, the topic for today is about travel. Broaden your horizons, how travel, new experiences, and BrainHQ can help your brain appreciate the world around you. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about the agenda for today. Uh, so kicking it off after the intro today, we're going to do a little bit of a poll. Uh, so what will happen is you'll see a poll window pop up. You'll submit your two answers. And then um, all of the uh, hosts and co-hosts will uh, talk about the results there. Uh, then following that, we have Dr. Tom Van Fleet giving a presentation today about travel. Uh, so he is a returning presenter to the webinar series. Uh, but for those of you who missed him the first time, uh, Dr. Tom Van Fleet earned a dual doctorate in neuroscience and clinical psychology at Northern Illinois University and had additional training in neuropsychology at the University of Chicago. He's been with Posit Science as a senior scientist and our director of sponsored programs since 2014. Then joining us is going to be uh, Dr. Don Colpin. Now, Don is a clinical training director at a mental health care company. Uh, but, but the thing that we're actually more excited to talk to him about is uh, he's an avid traveler and he's journeyed extensively both domestically and internationally. Um, so Tom and Don will go ahead and go ahead and have a chat. Uh, then the final part of the webinar today, there's going to be a live Q&A where I'll be fielding those questions for Tom and Don. Now, uh, for those of you that want to submit a question at any point during the webinar, you can click the little Q&A button on the Zoom control panel and a new window should pop up. You can type in your questions there and then we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can. Now, the last thing that I wanted to note is that today's webinar is being recorded and it will get posted to our YouTube channel probably sometime next week. Now, if you'd like to be notified when that video goes live, you can go to youtube.com slash brainhq in order to subscribe there and receive a notification. Now, everyone who's registered for this webinar should also receive an email sometime next week with any follow-up re resources that we may mention, uh, but that will also include a link to this replay. All right, uh, so Tom and Don, you want to go ahead and uh, join the call here while we launch this first poll. Uh, let me go ahead and get that queued up here. All right, so folks, there should be a poll with two questions. You might have to scroll down in the poll window to see them. Uh, the first question is, how often do you travel? Do you travel less than once a year, one to two times a year, three to four times a year, or four or more times a year? And then the second question is, how often would you like to travel? Uh, never, maybe you wanna stay in your house most of the time, sometimes, occasionally, frequently, or maybe you wanna travel as much as possible. We wanna know. Uh, so Tom, how often would you say that you travel? Uh, not as frequently as I would like. Uh, I'm traveling presently, uh, interestingly, during this webinar on travel. I'm actually visiting uh, Southern California with my family. Uh, my kids have their spring break this week. So I'm happy to get away for a week of uh, hiking and swimming and enjoying some warm Southern California sun. Absolutely, that sounds wonderful. And you've got a beautiful backdrop there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fake. Yeah, not fake, not a fake backdrop. <laughs> um, and uh, let me think, for me, I definitely, same answer. Um, I would like to travel more often than I currently do. I probably travel two to three times a year, maybe four times in a good year. Um, definitely trying to ramp up travel uh, travel activities now that, um, you know, the pandemic has been slowing down and all that stuff. So, um, all right. So it looks like we've had almost everybody answer. Um, so let me go ahead and end the poll there. And we can share the results with everybody here. So it looks like, uh, you should be seeing the uh, poll results here, it looks like a lot of people travel once or twice a year, but also a fair amount of people uh, travel three, four times, and uh, roughly the same amount of people travel less than once a year as travel more or four or more times a year. Um, and uh, it looks like we have a bunch of budding uh, travel enthusiasts here uh, looking at the second question, how often would you like to travel? 
uh, the vast majority said occasionally and frequently, um, and 17% even said as much as possible. Um, so I think that is a, um, a shared sentiment among most people here. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing those poll results for you. And I will go ahead and toss the uh, presentation over to Tom. Uh, Tom, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, so I'm here to speak to you a bit about uh, travel and how it influences your brain more generally. I'll be talk talking about a few studies specifically, but more about sort of the general level of engagement you can expect from your travels. If you've had a good travel experience, many of us uh, has, has had challenges, excuse me, have, have had challenges with traveling. If you've had a good travel experience, though, it's quite memorable to you. And you probably call it up in your mind quite vividly because those experiences are really uh, burned deeply into your brain, so to speak. And I'll speak a bit about how that happens neurologically. So uh, travel provides a lots of opportunities for your brain to, uh, to grow, to thrive, to improve many of the core cognitive functions that we speak about in this webinar series. Um, I think adventures as shown here by uh, Annis Lee are the best way to learn. It's very true if you've had a good, but perhaps challenging travel experience, you can look back on that with some fond sense of accomplishment, having conquered sort of the obstacles to get the sort of satisfying view or uh, experience walking through an ancient city or experiencing a unique meal or meeting new people from a foreign land or even those from your own home country that you don't typically visit with the north or the south, what have you. Um, experiences have been shown by a number of research studies, one most notably completed in 2003 um, showed that experiences provide a greater satisfaction than material goods. Although we work hard to save money and in our later years use that money to buy things we think will make us happy, that's usually results in a short-term satisfaction and that the real goods in life come from experiencing and engaging with the world rather than relying on some material good. And that's quite obvious to those of you have, who have waited perhaps anticipation for something they wanted so badly and then a few weeks later kind of fail to appreciate the value of that of the object. So, um, and I like this phrase here, the unknown uh, author is unknown, but some beautiful paths cannot be discovered without getting lost. So let's talk about some of the challenges and uh, cognitive operations we engage when we're traveling and how this may be beneficial, beneficial for us in, in the long term. So I'm gonna to speak to you briefly about five aspects of travel and how this impacts the brain. And we'll speak to you a bit more generally about how you may engage these same cognitive operations in your daily life. Namely that uh, new experiences that we often engage in in travel to new locations enhance the brain's change potential or neural plasticity. We know the brain's adaptive throughout the lifespan and the principles by which it changes is known as neuroplasticity. This is certainly heightened in new environments with new experiences, surprises, and, uh, and, and social engagements, among other things here, uh, not the least of which is travel elevates your mood. There's a lot of good studies showing that being in a novel environment, experiencing some level of challenge, not an overwhelming challenge, but deriving some satisfaction from having overcome a certain level of challenge as manageable, can lead to a great boost in overall sense of wellness and overall mood. And interesting, I looked into some research around creativity. This is sort of a, an open question in the area of neuroscience. How do we engage the brain to become more creative? And I learned out some, learned some interesting facts here I'll share with you here in a few slides. And then also overall how this impacts your memory formation. And we'll speak to the critical elements of memory formation and how they are actively engaged in travel. And then finally talk about how travel naturally fosters greater social connections and how this also feeds the vitality and health of our brain long-term. So new experiences. So oftentimes when you're traveling somewhere new, you're kind of excited, you're kind of scared, you'll anticipation, you get the guidebooks, you go through them, you sort of map out what you wanna see, but leave some room for you know getting lost or uh, not finding your way or uh, other various missteps, which may be fortuitous. You may see something that you didn't expect to see. Oftentimes this occurs when you're traveling on a, a large adventure, perhaps somewhere unknown, not the usual a local uh, camping trip or 
outing for a museum that you're familiar with, but more of a, you know, a, a novel situation could be a unique part of the country, unique part of your state, even your region or traveling overseas, for example, can really engage you in a, a, a milieu of new experiences that can drive the brain activation. We know that uh, these unexpected sights, sounds, and experiences drive a uniquely potent level of brain activation. This potency increases the brain's ability to adapt, sort of encourages it to adapt, given the novel uh, experiences involved in these travel experiences, for example. And what this looks like neurologically, if we take a deep dive under the skull, we can look into how you know brain recordings show that uh, under familiar circumstances, the level of brain activation uh, is much smaller relative to a novel or unique experience or a surprising or an unexpected, beautiful sunset on the beach. You, you didn't you know, plan to be there, but you happened to be there after dinner and sure enough, the sun was going down. And these sorts of spontaneous, novel, unexpected, surprising, pleasing experiences really drive a heightened level of brain activation, as you can see in this graph here much higher than sort of your familiar context or familiar people and places you would normally engage with. What I found most interesting when I was looking through this research is that the brain activation in response to novelty or surprise or that aha moment is even bigger than goal-directed targets of attention. So for example, I'm looking for my family or in a crowded uh, bizarre space, I have to find them. My goal is to look for anything familiar, what clothes they're wearing, et cetera. If in fact I see something surprising, unexpected, awe-inspiring, curiosity provoking, that brain activation will overwhelm the uh, target of my attention, which is my family. As we can see here, this red line is a much, smaller than sort of the unexpected novel sound in this particular experiment, above and beyond that sort of goal-directed focus of your attention. Well, this is quite interesting and that gives us great in insight into how the brain uh, turns on, how it adaptively changes, and what sort of stimuli or experiences are most likely to drive a more potent level of brain activation. Travel can also increase, uh, trigger the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter release in anticipation of enjoyable activities. Typically, travel involves trying new foods, engaging in adventurous activities, meeting new people. This can result in a heightened sense of happiness and well being. We've all perhaps heard about dopamine, and it's the pleasure neurotransmitter or pleasure drug, if you will, your brain produces naturally. But let's learn a bit more about how it actually works here. So, if we look at actually the way in which dopamine is released, it's greater if the experience is earned. So for example, if you're doing really nothing and this delicious meal is plopped in front of you, it's more likely that you'll enjoy it certainly, but perhaps if you had to work to get to the restaurant, you had to make the reservation, you had to stand in line, you had to wait in anticipation while you're smelling all the delicious food being made inside the restaurant while you're waiting outside the restaurant, these are things that are going to drive actually the increased expression of dopamine. It's getting you through sort of the effort involved in getting to the desirable outcome. So if we look at this behaviorally, and this is from a trends in neuroscience, highly cited study. I don't have the author's name here, but I can find that for uh, later reference. We're sort of balancing the incentive, the desire to have that uniquely interesting novel meal in a foreign land or a foreign part of the country. But yet there is a cost expected with mental effort, physical resources needed, fatigue, you're hungry and you're in line. <laughs> um, how does the brain work this out? Well, it so happens that effort in the um, face of potential reward or outcome drives the incentive factor and the release of dopamine, which gets you over the hump. It helps sort of balance this cost benefit ratio and it drives actions that are more likely to produce the desired outcomes. Hey, you know what, I can, I can wait five minutes, I can chat with my friend, I can you know, maybe even chat with the, the hostess or the host and see if I can make a new friend or learn something more about the type of food being produced or type of resources they bring to bear on the food production. I could use my mind creatively in some way to sort of span this time span between you know, the onset of dinner and the end of my waiting period. 
So this is where dopamine really has its maximal benefit. It's sort of offsetting this effort required to get to things that are nat naturally pleasing. So it's good to sort of think about how this may be redirected in terms of your mind. Oh, dopamine is the, the, the sort of pleasure drug and just elicits any time or expresses itself anytime I get a reward. Really, it's more about the earning aspects of it. Let's talk a bit about sort of the earning required in some aspects of travel and how this may affect people differently. You know, effects of travel on the brain can vary quite uh, uh, wildly between person, people, depending on the personality, your travel experiences, the specific nature of the travel, perhaps you have some work to do while you're traveling. So you're trying to divide your efforts, perhaps you're managing family or friends and their expectations as well. There's a fair amount of work involved in that rather than just going solo or with a partner or a friend and relaxing. These all sort of ratchet up the complexity of travel and may have an influence on the ultimate end product how your neurology or brain lights up in response to these experiences. But these challenges may be best viewed in light of the potential payoff. As we mentioned, dopamine is gonna be expressed most um, strongly in the uh, context of a mild level of challenge or moderate level of challenge. So you may consider, is it worth going to that unique sunset view? It's up these long flight of stairs. Well, it may be at the very end because you're exerting some effort and the reward could be that much sweeter. But it's also good to sort of bear in mind the travel requirements. Um, so let's talk about how travel may enhance creativity. This is a really interesting area of neuroscience. There hasn't been a lot of good definitive trials around boosting creativity. And creativity is sort of defined as nonlinear thinking, things that wouldn't be uh, logically put together from a sequence of ideas, but kind of nonlinear in nature and uh, expressing some previously unknown experience or idea or notion that could drive a whole unique set of behaviors. This is something we all strive for. It really lights up our brain if we're acting in a creative manner. And studies have shown that when the brain is exposed to new and stimulating environments, it, it can increase the cognitive flexibility, the problem solving skills, and by extension, originality or create creative thought or ideas or experiences. And this is an interesting path model here, sort of a science-y dive into what drives what in terms of the core aspects of creativity. We know that flexibility and persistence are two core elements which are necessary to drive originality in terms of creative production or output. And uh, flexibility is usually bolstered by positive activating mood. So if you're traveling, you're cutting yourself off from the usual burdens of your daily life, you're choosing to step out, you're experiencing some positive mood uh, automatically from that. You're perhaps a bit more flexible when you're traveling because you have this anticipation of positive outcomes if you're going to a desirable location. And this naturally bolsters your ability to be flexible, which produces uh, quite on a high order here. Most of the variance is attributed to flexibility. So the more cognitively flexible you can be, the more original thinking you'll have, the more creative thinking that you'll have. On the other side of the coin, there's sort of negative activating emotions, which are stressful circumstances. Your bus was late or you missed your flight. This requires you to exhibit, exhibit a level of persistence and your goal-directed activities, which also can contribute to creative thinking, original output. I think the vast majority based on those models being driven by sort of the overall flexibility. And travel is a great environment within which to leverage this process because you're subjecting yourself to situations where you can really get a nice mood elevation, uh, challenge yourself, be a bit more flexible and then benefit from the creative thinking and thoughts and, and experiences that uh, come out of that. So let's talk about how this affects memory. And uh, all these components really factor into the depth of memory processing, so to speak. So, you know, remembering someone's phone number back in the day was sort of abstract and shallow processing. You had to work really hard to invest yourself in those seven numbers. But when you're out traveling, seeing new things with family or friends that you enjoy, and you're really ha having a good time and you're relaxed, you're enjoying yourself and you're seeing new things, it really increases the novelty component, the emotional significance of your experience, which uh, ultimately helps consolidate deeper, more 
thorough, more accessible memories long term. So traveling to new places, trying new activities, learning about different cultures can all contribute to improved memory function because it has all the core elements of good memory, engagement, slight, slight level of challenge, novelty, and overall positive emotional significance. So we all know that travel fosters social connections. It usually involves meeting new people, building social connections with you know, the people you're renting your Airbnb from or the travel agent or the stewards on the plane. Uh, many opportunities for engaging in social interactions, um, not the least of which are um, coming from those you're traveling with and any new people you meet along the way. And this taps into an area of neuroscience called social cognition. This is a fairly new area of science that we are pretty excited about here at Posit Science. And we have several exercises that target various elements of social cognition. And uh, this is sort of how the brain works in the social uh, context, the social milieu amongst uh, others that were either engaged with intimately or casually or on a, a work basis. All many levels of social engagement interaction rely on many of the same cognitive operations, such as the recognition of emotion in someone's face or voice, or the manner in which they're carrying themselves physically. The ability to take some emotional perspective taking, this is called theory of mind. And you may see here in the bottom right corner, the person is trying to imagine what the other person may be thinking, trying to put themselves within their friend or partner's mind. This is a, a, a sort of concept or construct called theory of mind. It's part of social cognition. It does require a level of abstraction in the brain uh, within the social context and does require a uh, call upon certain uh, neurological operations uh, within the social context that are particularly notable. And then also your responsiveness to affective content or emotional content. So I got, you know, there's a tone shift in my partner's voice. What does that mean? Did I forget something? Should I, should I pivot in some way to, to meet that expectation? Uh, all these sort of subtleties that we often navigate unconsciously are all very well articulated and studied in the area of social cognition, and they're very much in play in the context of travel. And so we're gonna talk a bit about uh, enhancing these sort of core cognitive and emotional or mood regulation operations, not only in travel, but also in the context of the Brain HQ application. Uh, as we mentioned before, we know that new experiences that we engage in in travel enhance the brain's change potential or neuroplasticity. You can see from these images below on the sort of mid left there, we're looking at changes in connectivity or brain growth. This is actually new growth happening between brain areas that's elaborating in response to a challenge. And then on the uh, right of that, the uh, sort of orange and yellow bubbles are showing different types of brain activation or functional activation. Different brain areas are coming online in unison, firing in unison to accomplish a core operation, whether it be sort of the detection of what's relevant in a goal-directed behavior or navigating problem-solving or structured behavior in a way with our what's called our central executive network. So these two areas are also changing well, upon the application of a systemic challenge. So these areas in your brain are actively adapting, adapting, either growing physically to reconnect stronger and or becoming more in sync functionally to accomplish a core cognitive operation. And these are images from studies of Brain HQ, uh, which are showing that in fact, we are changing the physical connectivity of brain areas and also the functional integrity of how these brain areas come online, uh, speak to each other in sync and accomplish core cognitive operations. So both of these environments, if you will, change the brain, challenge the brain, travel certainly, we know firsthand does that. And then Brain HQ independently in the absence of travel, uh, if you're going to a brain gym, if you will, in this context, we can think about Brain HQ as a brain gym. You're engaging yourself in an adaptive level of challenge, very similar in some respects to the change that's incurred from travel. So you can't get away. It may be worth spending some time on Brain HQ to engage these same level of neuroplastic changes in your brain.
Uh, number two, we know travel elevates mood, as I touched on earlier. Uh, we know also that training in Brain HQ increases mood stability. There's a 38% reduction in the onset of depression, particularly in seniors. And there's a 30% reduction in the chance of any worsening of mood if, in fact, you uh, experience a depressive or anxious episode. This uh, Brain HQ training has been shown to bolster the integrity or the resilience, if you will, of a brain to suffer emotional setbacks or challenges uh, much more capably than uh, either control condition doing nothing, not doing Brain HQ or some other condition. This is from the large active trial, one of the largest trials of cognitive training conducted to date involving over 2,000 seniors. And then as we know, we touched on before, travel enhances creativity. We do know that Brain HQ is really capable of challenging your mental flexibility, one of the core drivers of unique thought, of creative thought, creative experiences. Uh, you may try the game Mindbender if you think uh, that you've mastered Brain HQ or perhaps you haven't been sufficiently challenged. This one always gets me. <laughs> And uh, it definitely requires a certain level of mental flexibility to be fluid in that task. Uh, I would uh, encourage you to give it a try today. Also, memory. All the elements of memory are also baked into our product and exercise format. You may try to-do list training or try any of the exercises in the navigation suite. One thing we didn't touch on much thus far in terms of travel. Navigation is a huge component of travel, traveling to unique areas or even areas that are less well-developed than your own uh, may require relying on paper maps or verbal instructions in ways that uh, require your brain to actively map the environment rather than relying on uh, you know, Apple or Google Maps to direct us, <laughs> uh, to, to spoon feed us in our way around the US. So, uh, and then also uh, travel, we know fosters social connections as I touched on before. Uh, we have several exercises in the people skills suite that also drive proficiency in these various social cognitive operations, including social cue perception, emotion recognition, and the like. All these feed into a more fluid capacity to engage socially, not only with those you're familiar with, but also strangers and also while you travel. So just to wrap up here, I touched on five notable aspects uh, of travel that affect your brain, how some of these may be gleaned, at least in preparation or in the absence of travel through brain HQ engagement, and how actively your brain is engaged in travel is a good index of how vital you have, how vital this organ is that sits inside your skull when in fact you're feeling the dull drums and not having traveled in a while, um, having been out for a few days myself on a current travel vacation, it's quite notable how after a couple of days, you're just more relaxed. Things are coming at you at a slower pace. You're more interested and engaged and um, your mood is certainly elevated. So I could speak to that firsthand <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your attention and listening to my presentation. All right, fantastic presentation, Tom. We uh, have a couple of questions that I'm saving for when we do Q&A at the end here. Um, but I want to go ahead and toss it over to you and Don um, here. Let me see if we can get Don back on the call here. Hang on just a second. All right. And there's Don. I will leave you guys to it. Okay, great. Don, thanks for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. For those of you who didn't hear the introduction, Don is a, a long-term friend of mine, mm -hmm. also another uh, psychologist in the mental health space. And uh, Don has traveled the world extensively and also the U.S. extensively domestically and uh, has many good stories and experiences to share with us. Uh, but I'll go ahead and get started with some, some questions we prepared beforehand, and then Don can share us a bit more about his experience. One thing I did ask Don to prepare to answer about was, uh, you know, having done both international travel and domestic travel, I guess, what is the distinct difference in your mind in terms of how you have to change your mental operations or your mm -hmm your thinking abilities around navigating domestic versus international travel. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the call. Uh, I, I was thinking about this again, and I feel like when you are traveling domestically versus internationally, it's it's like 30% the level of preparedness um, when you're, say, traveling cross-country versus when you're leaving the country and, and the things that go with it. Uh, so like the, the cognitive load is, is much more significant. Um, because it, it hits on so many areas that you just sort of take for granted about your day-to-day -day life. 
you know, uh, like if you lose a passport, lose a credit card, um, you know, basic things about transportation, um, even just understanding that uh, the way that people are going to try to interact with you or um, um, what are the cultural norms around just basic sort of scams that people like you kind of get used to like this is the kind of type of ruse somebody might run in a certain area and when you're out of context you really are a fish out of water um, which then also um, makes me think about how much one stimulus value changes um, when you're traveling generally but specifically when you leave the country you're used to people perceiving you in a certain way based on your skin color, your clothing, your stance, your age. And we take a lot of those things for granted or often are, are blind to them ourselves because we're not used to really thinking about just how the world perceives us. Uh, and that completely changes when you're dropped into, into an international context. And, and that can be a hard thing to appreciate uh, if you haven't done it before, had that experience. Yeah, I like those two ideas you hit upon. Context is a really important driver of familiarity and sort of brain orienting or providing some level of uh, familiarity or the behaviors that are usually typically called upon if we're in a familiar context are very different from an unfamiliar space such as international travel. And I also like how you said about the social aspects may be different too, like context may be very different as well, as well as the sort of environmental physical differences that you're not used to navigating. It's also the cultural, social expectations and norms are quite different in, in yeah. some parts of the world, certainly relative to the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also think it just, the other way I think about this is you, you sort of have to re, like relearn things that you take for granted, you know, um, and it's not always clear what those things are going to be. And for you, for you specifically, until you decide you're leaving the country, you know, like if you have kids versus not having kids, and if your kids are traveling with you, how are you managing that? So there's a different kind of management situation, uh, like things like med medical emergencies, access to medications, you know, if your credit card is lost, you know, how do you manage that? And then also just even thinking about currency, how are you managing your money? What is your access to money going to be like? Things that you just sort of take for granted, my credit card will work. Uh, this checking card will work, or my 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 phone pay can I can tap my phone, and are those things available to you? And if not, what are the things that will be available to you? And then how do you plan for an emergency? Like, do I carry cash with me? Do I bring cash at all? What are the consequences or implications of of um, bringing you know cash? And then in what what kind of currency do you bring? You know, is it sure? Is the place that takes yeah. U.S. dollars, and sometimes you're better off with U.S. currency than and carrying the local currency. Yeah, so many more contingencies you have to plan for when you're traveling abroad. I guess let's put this into a specific context. Do you have any uh, one or two good stories you could tell from a, a pretty particularly transformative travel experience you've had in the past? Maybe ways in which it affected your thinking or what was important for you, perhaps what has changed since experiencing that? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things that pop into mind. And I think one of them I want to highlight is... Um, the value and the experience. And I had to think back about this, actually. It's been so long since I thought about it, how powerful it was the very first time I was removed from my context and placed into a non-white, non-English speaking context and what that was like. And it was immediately as if like, here was my worldview and within a day, here was my worldview. Like it just expanded exponentially. Um, and it, and it, that, that hasn't stopped changing whenever I travel to a new place. However, I, I take it for granted a little bit now because I've gone through that process a number of times and I forget how incredibly powerful it was the very first time it happened and how it felt like um, I could have taken three years of coursework, you know, on travel or watched movies or watched documentaries and, and not had the level of experience that simply a few hours um, I'm thinking specifically the first time I arrived in Turkey um, and, and what happened to me in, in those moments. And, I, and it made me think at the time, it's like, this is something we should mandate for everybody. Everybody should have this experience of being dropped into a completely foreign concept uh, because it re-establishes so many base rates that we have that you don't even think about that are working in the background. Yeah. So yeah, I have a couple others. Let me pause on that one. 
Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I want to just follow up on one point you mentioned, sort of like, uh, not only is it important to focus on what you need to do or um, what you need to align yourself with when you arrive somewhere new, but what also what you need to let go of, like, hey, I need to let go of all these constraints I have around my social uh, sphere, how do I typically engage socially and open myself up to more possibilities. It's definitely interesting how you're sort of having this push pull, you're focusing on where you want to go, where you want to get to, but also letting go of all the trappings that you bring with you from a different context. And it's actually something I had written down is simply that that willingness to let go of one's expectations about what is normal, um, you know, which is what you're speaking to. I, I think it's it what differentiates those who can travel successfully and those who struggle. Um, is this, I want the thing to look and feel like the way that it normally looks and feels to me. I want people to treat me the way that I that people normally treat me in whatever context that I'm in. I actually thought that this, this might contribute to sort of like the ugly American stereotype is it's really, it's not so much about uh, American culture or values per se. It's about a person who arrives in a context and is unwilling to let go of the things that they're expected or used to. And that could happen to anybody, quite frankly, regardless of, of um, where they're traveling from. Yeah, so. that's really good. And I could say just a couple of experiences that I had in that same the circumstances where you have to let go of something that's not no longer working for you that you are pleasantly surprised oftentimes by the generosity or kindness of people you've never met before a culture you've never engaged with before it's mm -hmm. always again another dopamine surge happens when, when you like work so hard to get like a thing that's hindering you and you sort of get this pleasant sort of realization hey they're just no different from me it's just they like stare at me <laughs> culturally when i'm to turkey people stared at me a lot which was yeah. hard to overcome, but it mm -hmm. definitely led to a lot of good conversations. So, but there is there is this uh, this normalization of humanity that occurs, where you recognize that these people who look, feel, and act differently from you, and it's easy to see those differences from afar. But when you're in the context, you see the humanity, the connection, the sameness uh, that's there, and you're like, oh wait a minute, these people are kind of walking around. They're, they're doing the same types of things that people in my neighborhood do, you know, as far as how they move or the patterns of behavior. Um, and when it's different, you recognize what's different about it. And there are some specific places where those things were so drastically different. It also required a kind of adjustment. Um, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about India specifically where the, the India has a very unique um, culture around just space, personal space, and the way people move and the way people fill the space. It's a much more condensed um, uh, city, town, existence than, than most places that I've been to um, because it's, it's close <laughs> generally. <laughs> and, that, and that closeness extends throughout the entire city in some ways. It's always kind of omnipresent. And it was very unique to India, even when compared to other crowded uh, countries that I've been in. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm envisioning sort of the overcrowded bus scenario when you're trying to find your way to a seat if there's even a seat available. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. But you know when you're on the bus that you can get off the bus and you, things will be somewhat restored. And, yeah. and there are certain areas when you're traveling but that's not, that simply isn't available to you in the same way. Yeah. And you feel it cognitively. It kind of like it, it um, requires kind of an acceptance mindfulness approach in some ways to kind of... <laughs> A willingness to be with. Um, yeah. I think the other thing I wanted to speak to that uh, I think dovetails a little bit on the, the language and communication issue you, you asked about kind of powerful experiences um, was um, it, gosh, this had to have been at least a two, a two hour, possibly longer, maybe three hour experience uh, in Turkey where um, I arrived back at a place that I was staying. It was a place that I hadn't planned on being at in a place that didn't typically have tourists or any foreigners travel to, but was still kind of a big city. And um, I entered the lobby of the hotel where there were probably, I don't know, like six to 10 Turkish men hanging out, chatting, talking in Turkish. And they invited me to stay and sit with them, knowing that I don't speak any Turkish, I didn't speak the language at the time, yet, like included me in this conversation where I was communicating, even though I had no idea whether I was being made fun of or being included or not included, yet 
having this entire interaction unfold and making some kind of connection that, that involved like no language at all. Mm -hmm. And then culminated in the whole group at once or standing up, we moved to the rooftop of the hotel where um, they had boxes and set up and the, the person sort of leading the experience began sort of singing uh, what I assume were kind of like traditional sort of Muslim songs or I, I assumed something analogous to like religious hymns. I'm not quite sure what the right label would be. And um, at one point then pointed to me as if it was my turn now to, to, <laughs> to sing a song or sort of represent. And so being put on the spot, I was like, what, I, like, what do I do? I've never sang at this point in front of anybody. And the first song that popped into my mind was You Can Call Me Al by um, <laughs> Paul Simon off the album Graceland. <laughs> And I end up singing this song for them somewhat a cappella to silence. And then um, this kind of pause and then this like erupting in sort of cheers and, and, and laughter. That's great. That's and then, great. And, and within five minutes of that, the whole thing had disbanded. And I, <laughs> and in some ways, like this was a, a, a powerful experience for me in so many ways. And yet it's an experience that I don't fully understand how I was a part of it from their perspective and, and really will never, never know that, yeah. you know, it's so an unknown thing for me. Right. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So yeah, so unique too. And unexpected. It yeah. puts you on the spot too. That drives sort of a lot of, uh, you know, heightened attention. I'm curious, like uh, having had some of these experiences, how has that changed your thinking now as you're sort of navigating just your usual daily activities? Is that any sort of residual ripple effect from that? That experience specifically or travel in general? Yeah, I think maybe if there's been, I mean, it's a great story you provided about being put on the spot and having to yeah. creatively think of some song and sing it too. And like, does that change yeah. it all the way you navigate your daily life now? Or is that sort of a, a good memory or any of that impacting you? It, you know, I, the, the thing that I think about um, the way that travel impacts my daily life is um, my proximity to travel increases the the ease of which it is for me to do other things that involve like leaving the house or or camping or just local travel or kind of being social it's like once you once you have kind of unmoored yourself from your daily routine you're now unmoored from your daily routine and it's easier to make these other types of decisions the longer I am away from travel, the more kind of re-cemented I get in whatever the routine is of the day. And then the more energy it takes to build up the momentum, the planning, the prep to then like step out of one's comfort zone, which is, you know, even, you know, driving a few hours away is stepping out of one's comfort zone in some way. And, and so that is, I think what sort of stays with me is that my ability to do that and my willingness and, um, um, interest in doing that simply just has expands and increases the more that I do it. But even within that growth, there's still kind of an ebb and flow based on what's happened over the last few months or the last year and, and what levels of travel I happen to be engaged with. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So yeah, that familiarity with like stepping out into the unknown generalizes in some respects to, to other contexts, even now, um, years later. Um, yeah, that's really cool. There's some research I became aware of recently that shows if you um, have a certain level of discipline in one domain of your life, you decide to engage in some challenging travel experience. Mm -hmm. Say you've never been abroad. Hey, I'm not going to take this tour group. I'm just going to do it and tell my relatives where I'm at, etc. I'm just going to go do it. That sense of uh, inertia that's provided by having engaged willfully with some discipline mm -hmm. and effort and generalize nicely to other aspects of your life. Just try proving it to yourself. Hey, I can I can do this successfully. It's not that scary. Exactly. And it was a good outcome. And um, I can apply this to other aspects of my life. It's really highly generalizable. That, that's a great set of skills. Um, so going on to my next question here, I'm curious. So I think both you and I have traveled before the advent of cell phones and some level of technology, certainly. I mean, we're not ancient, but... Uh, I'm curious how technology from your experience has affected your, your, your value or your sort of overall um, cognitive challenge, mental challenge. How do you gear up for travel nowadays knowing you have all these technological 
hooks or props mm -hmm. to help you relative to before? This is great, a great question because it technology completely changes the travel experience. Um, when I think back to, I spent a year traveling the U.S. Uh, was my before I left the country, I had this very early experience of U.S. travel, and this was like early internet, you know, barely in internet happening then, and definitely way before cell phones. You know, I was making phone calls from pay phones, you know, from various places to touch base with family or let people know where I was. Um, and then when I was traveling through Turkey, it was early internet that was able to send emails and, and look up some things, but there wasn't a wealth of travel information. And then now in the last few years, it's, you know, I was in London um, uh, in January and Google Maps is walking me through how to use the, the tube in, in the London subway. And this would have taken me like 10, 20, 30 minutes or an hour to understand how to buy a ticket, where to go, what stop to get off, how do I read the map? And I literally put the destination into Google Maps and it just walked you through step by step by step. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Even like which side of the train to get off of or how to like navigate entering things. The amount of detail was extraordinary. Wow. And so, so what it does is it, it certainly reduces some of the, the preparatory cognitive load um, um, related to travel, as you were pointing out. But I think a bigger deal um, that's, that's a little bit harder to appreciate is that it changes what it feels like to travel on a fundamental level. So when I, um, let's say went to Turkey in that first trip, it wasn't like I could call a friend. It wasn't like I could reach out to family directly. Um, it changes who and how you communicate with people, not just where you are. You don't have the same level of communication um, you also just don't have the same things you do to waste and fill time. I'm scrolling through TikTok. I'm on the internet. I'm checking this thing on my phone. I'm answering an email immediately. And what, what effect that has had, I've noticed for me, is I don't feel the same sense of I'm out there in the frontier in a new place because 10%, 20%, 30% of it is still connected to my normal routine. Mm. And, and we just sort of talked about like one of the things that's valuable at travel is not just where you go, it's a disconnection and a stepping away from your normal patterns of being. And to the extent that you have that technology, you don't have to step away from as much as your life and those normal routines as you would have prior to this technology existing. Yeah, and, yeah, that's really, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was saying that, that, that to me changes travel. Like it fundamentally yeah. changes the experience. Quite dramatically too. Um, so I could uh, speak with you. I have several other questions for you, but let's go ahead and defer to our uh, audience members for some live questions. Yeah, so uh, fantastic discussion. Lots of questions regarding some of the points that you were talking about. Um, actually, going back to the point that we were, or that you were just making where, um, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, the without traveling frequently, you have like sort of this reluctance to travel. There's like more of an obstacle to sort of build up that momentum. Um, Janet writes in and Janet says, the lack of travel during the pandemic has certainly affected the ability to step out into the unknown. I was once an extensive traveler. I'm now restarting again and finding it so much more challenging on several fronts. Energy planning went many more aspects versus just letting things happen. Um, so my question is how can I access the old way of traveling or will it just come as I do more traveling in the future? Yeah, I would say more the latter. It, it, part of it is sort of accepting the fact that this change is real and you can't fast forward through it. You know, and the good news is that um, relearning or re-engaging with a skill that you already have, you'll learn it 10 times faster than it took you the first time. But I had the same kind of experience and it threw me. It was so confusing. I was like, why is this so anxiety provoking? I've done this so much. Did really just taking a few years off impacted that greatly. And um, I've heard other people say the same thing. I think it's really common. Um, and, and I have faith you'll work through it. It's just very disorienting to, to have that monkey wrench get thrown at you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a couple of people write in uh, who maybe um, are 
travel averse or unable to travel for whatever reason. Um, and they're wondering um, sort of um, other things that they can do in their daily lives that would also, um, you know, increase those dopamine levels, like going to performing art shows or uh, mm -hmm. reading or watching uh, television that features um, different places around the world, um, trying out new restaurants, uh, Tom, like you had said mm -hmm. in your presentation, you know, taking that extra time to smell those smells and see those new sites. Um, are, are there sort of other ways to get those benefits of travel without having to travel too, too far? Certainly, I think those are all great ideas. I think, uh, yeah, some level of novelty is engaged in all of those activities, going to a new restaurant, taking, taking a new route to the park or to work or to a friend's house or uh, shifting up your schedule routine a bit. Um, engaging socially also is an, usually an open-ended endeavor. You can't ever really engage or write the script for any social engagement. So it does require some mental flexibility, some emotional attunement these things you naturally get from placing yourself in a foreign land um, can be gleaned uh, right here at home too. I don't know if Don, any other thoughts around that too? You know, every now and again, I walk around the block without my cell phone. <laughs> like, and it's surprisingly difficult, you know? <laughs> like, you know, I, I think, right? So like novelty, difference, challenge are all kind of relative to what your, what your certain comfort zone is and asking yourself, am I willing to step out of it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I think you also highlight the fact that, you know, not only is it engaging new things or new routines or mm -hmm. uh, new restaurants, new friends, it's also giving up those familiar <laughs> props that uh, serve us in some way, but giving up, up for a while willfully can really have a pretty dramatic uh, experience. Yeah. And that, that dovetails on what we were talking about earlier. There's, there's the value of the new, and then there's the value of being unmoored from the familiar. And that may be the easier way to think about it is like, how do I, how do I un unmoor myself from just my reflexive patterns of daily life, you know, and that may be a, a, a place to start. Um, yeah, no, that's really good. And we saw from that little graph on brain activation, the familiar is kind of muted relative to the new or unexpected, even relative to what you're looking for, what a target is for your attention. If you see something unexpected or new or awe-inspiring or curiosity provoking, you're going to have the larger activation potential in your brain. Can I comment on that for a second? Because that's like <laughs> really, really grabbed my attention because it it really helped me understand how that it actually defines how I approach travel um, and, and why I approach it the way that I do, which is if I'm going to be somewhere for like a week or two, I'm thinking about two things. Why am I going there? Is it to see a certain thing, to do a certain thing or have a certain experience? And I want to make sure that I plan that. And I want to make sure that if that thing takes four days, I want to share that I have six days because there's nothing worse to me than having that novelty show up in front of me and not being able to follow it. <laughs> it's like, I will avoid that at all costs. And I thought maybe that was just FOMO or whatever it was. But when you describe it as this, it's almost like there's a part of my brain that doesn't want to miss that dopamine hit because it knows how powerful it is, you right. know? And that's a real, and seeing that that's a real and measurable thing is very instructive for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it definitely, um, it, that that also was a surprise to me looking at that slide and seeing what the difference was between those two different groups there. Um, speaking of activities to do um, while you're on vacation, you know, those things that you look forward to, you chasing that dopamine, if you will. Um, are there uh, specific activities when visiting a new place, like going to museums or hiking or local eateries? Are there any sort of particular activities that are going to be more beneficial than another? I could make a guess at that. Um, you know, it, it's really easy, depending on where you're going, it's really easy to go to a place and go to the McDonald's, you know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, so like, you know, and then and then this is also a little bit the difference between um, the benefits of, of traveling not as part of a tour versus traveling as part of a tour. Because the tour is planned, it has an agenda, it, it has a kind of a, of a routine to it. And that will, that locks out the novelty. Right, that locks out that entire component of the benefit of the travel, the ability to follow or have that experience. So, um, I think that's a general question. Specifically, this might vary based on where you are. You know, like taking a walk through the city in London is different than, say, uh, taking a walk through the city in, in say, like um, 
somewhere else, you know, in Marrakesh. It, yeah. yeah, in Marrakesh. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So like the, the specific activity is very much relative to what's familiar to you. And then like, what is its stimulus value relative to the location? You know, um, but I also but I do generally think about what is unique to this place? You know, what can I only do here? What can I only see here that I can't really see or do anywhere else? And that will usually guide you in the right direction. Yeah, I also like the notion that, you know, as we get older, it's convenient to take tour groups and we can leave the, you know, the driving and the planning to someone else and just go and relax and immerse ourselves. I think those are great experiences and some are, you know, there's a lot of value to that, certainly. But given your comment, it may be worth building an extra day after the tour just to yeah. revisit the places you were moved by. Can you just have a coffee in that big square instead of having to go through and see all the sites and move on to the next location. Can you come back there for a few hours and hang out and how that may be a very different experience than your travel pre-canned experience? Yeah, building in pre-post time is a great poem. Yeah, um, and so kind of going back to um, the point that you had made about um, uh, Wow, absolutely just brain farted there. Anyway, I'll <laughs> I'll just go ahead and ask the question instead of trying to make a cool transition to it. Um, okay. So <laughs> um, we had a question that was emailed to us. Um, are there cognitive benefits to going on a cruise instead of traveling somewhere new? Um, so I think what I was trying to get at was, you know, the having a preset um, sort of like a tour sort of situation where maybe a lot of the stuff is done for you. A, a cruise seems like it might be sort of a, a similar situation. A cruise is a completely different type of experience, mm. right? Um, and I think the, the cruise, it's kind of a unique experience because the cruise is often about the experience of being on the boat mm. and what's happening on the boat with these added bits of novelty where you stop and get off and look around. So, you know, I, I was actually, I was going to make a joke about the difference between traveling, planning your own travel, doing a can tour, like, and doing a cruise. Um, and I don't want to disparage cruises too much. But I think it is very fair to say that each one of those is a fundamentally different kind of experience. And so really asking yourself, what is the experience that I want to have? And yeah. does this decision meet that level of experience? Because um, cruises bring a whole nother uh, bag of variables about being on a boat, being in like a tight space in a cabin, you know, the just the level of excess that happens around like food and drink and all those things that are wonderful to indulge in at various points with, with especially if you're with a group of people that you enjoy being with. Um, but it's the the time on the ship itself far outweighs the time you spend on foreign land having a look around. And then the other thing that happens with cruises is that you're only able to get so far into the country. And because the cruise ships follow a similar pattern, what you're able to see is often a very curated, tourist, limited experience of what the country actually has to offer. Now, there's obviously lots of exceptions to that that's not always the case, you know, but you want to be thinking about that, um, those kind of things as you're kind of deciding if that's a fit for you. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it too. It's like sort of what experience are you looking for? And perhaps if you've done nothing but cruises, maybe it's a good time to venture out into a land-based tour where you could stay in hostels or hotels along the way and have a similar benefit of the structured nature of, of uh, cruises, but you're being out in the wild perhaps and going a little more into the deeper, more coveted spots in various locations that you would otherwise un not be able to see by virtue of a cruise. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a time we were in Greece, I think is a really great example of this, that there was, um, we were on um, Santorini and we're exploring all these other cities on the island and moving around. And 90% of the people who left the cruise ships that came didn't leave that immediate, like, yeah. you know, quarter mile area off the dock. Yeah. Right. Right. right? Totally. Very different yeah. experience. It's very different experience. Right. And that's an area that we visitors didn't even go into because it was so overrun with, with tourists and um, you know whatever it was overrun, we just kind of stayed away, right? Yeah. So yeah, totally. Like that's it. a great example. All right. Um, so it looks like we have a couple more questions, but unfortunately, we are kind of out of time. 
uh, for today's webinar. Um, so I wanted to uh, thank you all for participating, asking all those wonderful questions. Again, so sorry that we didn't get a chance to answer all of them. Um, thank you once again to Tom uh, for hosting the presentation and Don for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. Um, Thanks, Tom. And uh, for everyone else interested in our next webinar, um, our webinar next month is going to be all about the personal trainer as part of our office hours webinar series. And that will be taking place on May 17th. Um, once again, the recording of today's webinar will get posted on our YouTube channel sometime next week. So you can go to youtube.com slash brainhq and subscribe there in order to get that notification. Um, other than that, uh, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you all again so much for participating. Thank you, Stephanie. Good to see you. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.